to this session about one of the most uh, debated issues this time, which is post-truth, and how can leaders from all sectors of society can restore trust and collaboration, and also, I can say, fight fake news, fight disinformation, and restore also the importance of truth in our societies. So we have a great panel today. I will begin with my colleague, uh, YGL Bernice Ang. She's principal and methodology lead of Seroth Lab Singapore. She's a young global leader, as I told you, and she has a background of psychology studies and also science and data. Please, a big applause for Bernice. Here in my right is Felipe Stefan. He's principal of investments on Media Network USA. He structures and manages investments in Latin America as part of Omedia Network Governance and Citizen Engagement Initiative. He leads the firm's effort to advance civic technology, independent media, open data, and fiscal governance in the region. In the context, context of this role, Felipe is a member in the board of directors of IMCO and Nosas Cidades, an observer of the board of Collab Dot re, and a member of the Board of Advisors of Chequeado.com, which is one of the leading Argentinian media outlets uh, fighting fake news. An applause to Felipe, please. <laughs> and a Chilean politician, Felipe Cas Somerhoff, is member of Congress, also a young global leader, and he's also a presidential candidate for the next election in this year. He's also, uh, he's represented Santiago for this period. He's an economist. And from 2011 and 2017, he was the presidential delegate for Chilean reconstruction after the earthquake. He was also minister of social development, and now he's running for president. An applause for Felipe. things you want to share, please begin to think about this, post-truth. So I will begin asking Felipe Cast, how is uh, politics changing uh, because of post-truth and fake news? And because we had in Chile an episode, uh, uh, the fir our first, we can say, massive epi episode of post-truth and fake news with the fires in the summer, where through social media, uh, there was a viralization of content saying, fake things like Mapuches were uh, bis, uh, behind this, these attacks. So, Felipe, how is politics changing uh, in our country, in the region, because of this? And especially now that we have an electoral uh, year in Chile. Well, first of all, thank you, everybody, to be here. Um, I will say it's changing a lot, because now you have politicians that instead of trying to win with their deep ideas, um, many are trying to win elections um, in the short run, just bringing emotions into the game. So actually, you now that you have the technology to know what each uh, single person feels about everything. And that is a complicated uh, story because uh, you need um, a lot of effort in order to uh, compete uh, in that field. Um, I can know from Facebook, from media, like what do you feel? And I can directly cheat to you saying what you want to listen. Um, and you can create these clusters of people. It used to be the case that we get information through uh, kind of the media, traditional media. So the journalists, people like you, used to be the filter in order to realize what is true, what is not true. Um, but I'm, and now, obviously, that's not the case. So we face this uh, dilemma, and everybody's tempted in politics to, to cheat a little bit. Um, that's why you really need <coughs> political parties, and you need a new kind of type of journalist that are doing what probably Felipe is trying to do. And I am optimistic about the future, because I'm, I'm sure that you can lie to people one time or two times. But eventually, uh, everybody will realize that actually, uh, in this new scenario, you need to get more prepared, more informed. And therefore, uh, you need to create this new type of leadership that is really kind of deep in terms of their principles, their ideas, why you're doing what you're doing, what is your view. And at the end of the day, 
everything is going to turn okay. That's my hope um, that eventually people are smart enough to realize through social media uh, what is true and what is not true. Right now, we are that kind of in the transition moment, and hopefully this will happen soon. And Felipe, have you suffered so far in your presidential candid candidacy? Fake news episodes or not yet? Yes, actually there was, there was a, a book written about my family, very sad, and kind of trying to mix information. And, and you, you deal with that, you have to confront that. The worst thing you can do right now is hide your head under the floor. Um, you really have to be very straightforward. The good thing is, is actually everybody is very open to get your point of view. And you have the channels to really open your point of view in a very transparent way. So what you may think is something bad to you, because someone is attacking you, eventually it may turn out to be really good. Okay, so at the end people would yeah. value you being there straightforward and then clarifying the information. Felipe Stefan, your foundation has done enormous work in this field and also by funding important projects that are fighting fake news, disinformation, hate speech. And you told me that you have uh, given $100 million to to, for this issue, so for this fighting this. So what's your perspective? I mean, your point of view is that what is important is to support media outlets and, and organizations working to restore truth? Uh, yeah, thanks, Paula. Delighted to be part of this conversation. And uh, of course, to all of you in the room, good morning. And to all of you watching on live stream, um, good morning as well. Um, I might say a couple of things that are controversial. So I want to make sure that everyone has my Twitter handle so That's that you right. can criticize me amply and say that I am wrong as many times as you would like. Uh, so at Felipe Stefan, hashtag fake news. You can send all your hate speech over there. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, to, to your question, and thanks for bringing this up, um, Omedia Network is a philanthropic investment firm uh, that has been working on the fields of independent media and good governance for uh, about 10 years. And we made an announcement yesterday that we will be committing $100 million to boost journalism, uh, fight fake news, and fight hate speech online. And very excited about uh, the possibilities of what we can do with that kind of funding, not only um, all around the world through networks that are already there, but also promoting new initiatives in places like Latin America. Um, I think um, I I'm delighted we're having this conversation. I think this conversation is incredibly timely, but um, the act of lying and the act of the powerful to manipulate uh, information is nothing new. Mm -hmm. um, that has always been the case. Historically, uh, there's always been ways in which to manipulate existing channels and dynamics. I think going to what Felipe was just saying, um, the complexity and the sophistication of the issue um, has become a lot more than what we've seen in the past because of some of the dynamics that social media creates, whether it's filter bubbles or whether it's the ability to promote misinformation in a way that appears for it to be trustful. Um, and so let me make a, a, a statement that hopefully will lead us on into uh, a, a robust conversation, and is that democratic systems fail in the absence of trust. There is no way in which a uh, society in which there's absolutely no trust to public institutions and to media can truly function in the way that it should. The reality of it is that the causes of the mistrust, the very high mistrust that we see today between uh, citizens and public institutions, sometimes rightfully so, those causes are oftentimes not quite as dangerous as what happens in the absence, in the full void of trust. Because those with powerful interests, those with the ability to manipulate and sophisticate the tools that we have today to connect with one another, uh, will be very smart at using them to promote their own interests. And so it is only whether we start promoting the ability for institutions to deserve the trust of citizens, for media to be able to innovate in the way that it goes about storytelling, for philanthropy to be able to promote initiatives that build bridges across different groups, that will be able to start getting into the dynamics of trust necessary to make sure that we can pursue social impact. Thanks, Felipe. And Bernice, uh, as Felipe says, 
this post-truth sounds really for me like an, an euphemism. Like it's, it's a lie, right? I mean, it's, it's been there for ages. So, but what's new now is that people through social media would viralize these lies and that people will believe that. That's what happened in, in, the, in the American election and what happened in Chile's fires, that people will begin, like intelligent, smart, uh, people would begin to believe that really Mapuches were, you know, uh, firing the country and things like that. That's the, the, the danger, right? So why is the case, Bernice, that people begin to believe this without any kind of filter, uh, information that's coming from no media outlet uh, and it's coming from anybody, like, oh, at WhatsApp, like WhatsApp group said, you know, this is happening here. So why is people believing this? Right, uh, well, good morning to everyone. Uh, both here and online, thanks for having me. Uh, that's a really good question, and I'm gonna throw in a, a behavioral lens to this. So in psychology or cognitive science, um, there's, there's this thing that's been popularized by Daniel Kahneman now called systems, system one and system two thinking, or the, the book title is Thinking Fast and Slow. Right, but what does that mean? System one, or thinking fast, is the immediate response that we feel or that we experience as an emotion when we see something, right? But it's, it's the one that comes to us most easily. It's not system two, which is the deliberative, thoughtful, like, hang on, what is, what is this person saying? What are the facts here? Um, is, this, is this for real, right? So evolutionarily, we are primed to, to think on systems one basis because that's what helps us survive. If there's something, you better be quick to react, even if it's, if it's wrong in the end, but you err on the side of caution. But in this sense, we have now, in this case, we've been, um, this function has been used in information uh, manipulation, such that not only are we being fed a lot of uh, different types of data, but the kind of uh, data that's become more viral is the one that appe appeals to system one thinking more. And among the different emotions that that stimulates, anger is one of those uh, very immediate ones. And so, and anger happens to be the emotion of populism too. So there's no surprise why this is what we are seeing now and this is what is most viral at the time. Yeah, very interesting, thinking one and two. So uh, how is, uh, I mean, in, from the point of view of media and from the point of view of politics, this is a question for, for the three of you. How do you, I mean, what kind of solutions? Because we, have to, we have to create solutions. We have to find a way besides, you know, picking up, as Felipe is saying, or funding media outlets or trying to support people, fact-checking and all that. But what do we do? in order to educate people or to fight this so that we don't have, you know, as an outcome, populism, as you said. So, Felipe, Felipe. <laughs> Felipe one, Felipe two. Uh, sure, I'm, I'm happy to go. I, uh, so, so you're asking me how to solve yeah. the problem of trust yeah. this is the around way. the world. <laughs> we get um, things done. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, me, let me try to give some solutions and hopefully those uh, spark a conversation. And, uh, and again, to the audience, feel free to, feel free to question those. Um, to me, the, the crisis of trust is a crisis of representation. And the crisis of trust is a crisis of listening. We've uh, gotten far too used to uh, debating rather than dialoguing. Um, it's easier to uh, express what our view for an issue is, is that rather than actively listening. And like Bernice was saying, going, making the overt step of going out of our comfort zone and actually understanding the implications of the information that we're given. So I think there is definitely a role for organizations not only to practice, uh, but to also promote um, efforts uh, for active listening, both at the individual level and also in terms of organizations and in terms of how we debate. Um, I think we also need to increase web literacy. Um, I think oftentimes people th say that the crisis of trust 
online has to do with the lack of news literacy, but I actually think it's the lack of web literacy. It's not that you take one piece of information that is in front of you and based on what is on that page, you decide whether it's true or not, but actually that you're able to look at the other sources, to look at the history, to be able to take that piece of information and run it into a search engine and to actually take the effort necessary to understand how uh, valid is that piece of information and that requires web literacy and as we continue to bridge the digital divide increasing web literacy and be able to promote that will be a big part of fighting um, against fake news. I think the other thing is that in, philan in philanthropy we have to uh, provide funding and support to organizations that are bridging cultural divides. Um, and, that, and that could be in many cases. So for example, in the case of government, the reality is that it is the onus of trust towards government is on government institutions. It's not a problem of the citizens that they don't like government. It's actually uh, on the government to warrant that trust. And so can we promote government efficiency? Can we provide through civic technology, uh, promote the modernization of government so that it's most likely to warrant trust? The same thing with media. Media is in a, in a deep crisis, a uh, deep crisis of profits, of advertising revenue. And at the moment in which we most would need media to be able to serve as an arbitrary in relation to that trust between citizens and institutions, media is at its uh, at the moment of, of most crisis. And so how is it that we could break through a public sphere of information? I think it has a lot to do with being able to promote and support media both in experimenting on financial sustainability models, but also on experimenting on creative ways for multimedia storytelling. We're seeing, for example, on fact-checking that very boring long articles related to fact-checking don't really get anywhere. Yeah. No one wants to read that. But the use Sorry. of humor and, and gifts, for example, to promote fact-checks is actually getting to a far greater reach. So is there a way that we can break through that noise um, through innovations in multimedia storytelling? And then perhaps one, one last one is um, building the capacity of citizens and of civil society to use data and to use technology tools in a far more sophisticated manner. Because the reality is that we live in a world in which powerful interests already know how to use those tools in as sophisticated of a manner. And oftentimes with civil society and with average citizens, we're always catching up. And so what happens is that, as I was saying earlier, uh, those in power have lied many times before, but now they're doing it in a more sophisticated manner using social media. We are also, as users, using social media in a more, much more sophisticated manner, but we're never quite catching up. And so I think anything we can do to promote capacity building efforts for citizens and civil society to be able to really think about sophisticated and innovative uses of the tools we have available today would probably go a long way. So yeah. hope. Yeah. I, I don't know how far I got, but hope that's, no, it's that's okay. useful as a starting point. As a journalist point. and editor, I have to say that even though a lot of media outlets have a crisis in the business model, uh, after the, the, the US election, there's been a boom in subscriptions. The New York Times is doing great work, New Yorker, you know, Washington Post. So there's, there's a vitality because you know, journalism is now more important than ever. So this, the two sides of the, of the coin, right? One hand, yeah. there's a crisis in the business model, that's true, but on the other hand, uh, I think that journalism is now uh, to the public uh, clearly one thing that is really, really important to go through this phase. And I want to ask Felipe Cast, is it harder now to be a politician and to be a presidential candidate? I mean, in the sense that before you had, of course, all the exposure to normal media, we can, we can say classic media, going through all your, you know, everything in your life and previous life and your current life. But now you also have this, the possibility of being, you know, mistreated through social media with things that are not true. So how is it? Are you super brave? No. It requires some kind of hero. No, no, no. Actually, talent. let me let me answer uh, shortly before your previous question, what to do. And I think we, we there's nothing to do. I mean, everything is going to sort out well eventually. Um, and I think if you, if you and the, the, the crisis of trust that you were mentioning, I think has two sides. One is obviously that everybody can get news that are completely fake, which I think is the easier part to solve because everybody, as I was saying before, you start kind of being less, um, you're going, you start being kind of more skeptical about the information you get. 
So every person as a rational human being will realize how to really get uh, to the real story. And even in the case of Mapuches in Chile, eventually everybody knew that actually was fake. So as you were saying, journalists, uh, everything is about reputation, right? So the, the game of reputation is very important. And everybody, even a politician, has to play that game. If you want to really get everybody to trust that you have nice ideas and actually you are there for the right reasons, you must be careful about your reputation. So about what to do, I'm not that worried about what to do. I think everybody, bottom up, not top down, will solve that problem. But we do have another problem, which is the, the crisis of trust is coming from the fact that some institutions and some people are actually behaving really bad. And therefore, these institutions and those guys who were kind of leaders in the traditional way are getting less and less trusted by the people. So if you want to solve that, there's only one way to solve that, behave well. And be kind of aware that it's not only about making profits, it's not only about kind of looking at your, uh, yourself as the center of the universe, but you are playing a game that is more complex, with more people, everybody's watching at you. So uh, as, uh, the way to solve this problem is first, I'm not that worried about this kind of misinformation because eventually everybody knows what's going on. And the puzzle is what happened in the United States. Why, uh, uh, the, even though everybody knew that actually many of the things that actually Trump was saying were not true, he won. And that is a, is a, is a very nice puzzle. Um, and my feeling is that he won for different reasons. Not because he was lying, but because everybody was very angry about the other option. Um, that is my call on why in a more systematic way, because what I'm telling you is that this kind of game of lying, it won't last forever. But in the case of Trump, in some way, it worked. Um, and and my, my point of view is that everybody was very angry about the establishment, and therefore that was very in favor of Trump. And moreover, he used technology in a way that was very smart. And now everybody is going to use it, so probably it won't be a, a competitive advantage for everybody and that easy. And is it harder now to be a politician in this context? Or? <laughs> no, I think it's fine. It's, 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 I mean, you can, you can really talk in a more transparent way. I don't need to call a journalist, big kind of journalist, to ask for an interview. You can really, everything is about the content. Even in my campaign group, we talk every Monday uh, in the meeting, and, and we always think about the content. Everything is about the content and about reputation. Um, so it is harder because you need to, you get a lot of accusations. Some of them are, are, are not true. But as I was saying, um, even when they attack you, you can use it as an opportunity to show what you really believe. So all the channels are open. So I think it's actually it's easier today to be a politician than, than it, what it used to be, because you, you must, in the, in previously, in order to be a politician, you need to have a lot of money, you need to be really kind of uh, from the establishment. Now the barriers are lower, so the market is more open for new ideas. And Bernice, uh, from the perspective of increasing web literacy and, and, and helping people to go from thinking one to two, I mean, to have more reflection, what can we do? Hmm. This is uh, fundamentally a culture change question, I think. And culture change takes time. So I was actually kind of uh, struck by something that Philippe said earlier, that as long as people behave, then you know, the system will, will act as, a, as according. Um, but one of my concerns is also with the American system, where if, if good behavior were to reward support, why are we seeing this kind of asymmetrical uh, force happening, asymmetrical dynamic, where citizens are still supporting Trump mm -hmm. despite him uh, saying blatant lies? So this brings, this is actually a concern that I have about a culture of accepting lies. Well, I mean, fake news is, is part of that. It's another way to describe it. But it's a culture of saying that, okay, yeah, he's just going about his thing and that's just him. That's just Trump. And that is the kind of thing that will break down uh, democracy. Uh, it breaks down the forces that keep uh, uh, democratic forces active as they should. So this is also, which means that this is a chicken and egg, right? Where do you start first? Do you change the behavior of the politicians first or you improve the discerning uh, capacity of citizens first? Uh, of course, the answer is both have to happen. 
but where in the absence of good behaviour, then ground-up movements have all the more potential and opportunity to create the shift uh, to turn that around. Okay, so now we are going to open the floor for comments and questions. I would only ask you to be very, very brief so that everyone can have the chance to, to make a question to the panelists or to, to comment uh, or to debate. <laughs> uh, we have micro, so yeah, here please. There's. I'm sorry that I'm giving you my back, but. Paula, quizá podemos tomar más de una para que puedan participar más, ¿no? Hi, Duncan Wood from the Wilson Center. Um, I saw a fascinating interview the other day with uh, five Trump voters. And they were asked, you know, do you, uh, are you upset that the president lies to you? And they were all upset that he lied, but more upset that he wasted his time talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger, ratings of his TV show, <laughs> things like that. And, what they, and just to reinforce what you were talking about, Felipe, was that the idea that uh, they want to see goods delivered to them. They said, we're happy to, ex we, we will accept all of his BS on social media as long as the jobs come. And I thought that was quite encouraging because ultimately it was about results. But then there's the other side of the story. The fact that this kind of extreme speech on social media encourages groups within society that otherwise would remain quite uh, quiet and, and not so active. And I think that's one of the things that, that worries me the most because it provides an outlet for those groups which they wouldn't have otherwise. And I think we're seeing it not just in the United States but across the world right now. So I'd, I'd like to hear your reactions to that. Thanks so much. And we are receiving questions and comments in Spanish and English and Portuguese. So there's translation, so please. Uh, so your comments and then we're going to have different questions here while our panelists can address the, the comment and the question. Felipe? I, I think that that's exactly right, and thank you for for that comment and that question. And going back to what Felipe was saying, um, it is true that it's about the ability for government to deliver. Um, the the reality of it is that when I speak about the crisis of trust being a crisis of representation and a crisis of listening, is because citizens feel that government doesn't understand their needs and isn't well positioned to actually deliver on addressing those needs. The, what makes me hopeful um, about that is that problems that government has faced are age old and still remain. Uh, willingness for corruption, uh, tendency to mismanagement, uh, inefficiency. But some of the tools that we have today to be able to address those problems are actually much more effective and sophisticated than ever before. And so I, I'm hopeful that things like civic technology will allow governments to start listening to citizens better. Um, we're seeing it uh, all around the world, certainly in Latin America, organizations like uh, Colab are providing a platform for government to be able to, in real time, listen to citizens and respond to citizens. Um, I think that uh, we're seeing that, for example, in places like uh, Brazil, where participatory budgeting was born, where at the very local level, citizens are able to participate in determining what the budget for their community, the investment budget of their community should be going to, so that it truly is most likely to address their needs. And so I, I think that's, that's exactly right. You can cannot sell a box of chocolates that has no chocolates. So at, 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 some point, at some point, someone will open the box and will realize there's no chocolates here. So the, the true ultimate solution to that crisis of trust will be for governments to be able to deliver because trust is not the problem, trust is the symptom of the broader issue. Thank you. We're going to take three comments in a row and so then the panel will address three. Felix? Yes. Um, Present yourself, please. Yes, my, um, my name is uh, Felix Maradiaga. I'm a young global leader. Well, actually, alumni now, <laughs> and I run a, a always think tank. young global leaders forever. Um, <laughs> since 2009. Um, thank you for this fascinating discussion. I would like to uh, hear your comments regarding uh, what could be the role of those of us who are in the policy world, in the academia, think tanks, to actually connect with people at the grassroots. So, uh, for in my case, I work all around uh, Latin America, but particularly in Central America, and it's becoming increasingly hard to, to, to really counter the wave of populism, precisely because the, 
the way in which populists communicate with the majority of the people seems to be more effective in terms of persuading. And for those of us who do, as I said, policy research and try to persuade, it's becoming increasingly hard. What are some of your comments regarding the role of academia and think tanks uh, in encountering populism in Latin America? Thank you. And there we have Elias Selman, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Elia Selman from America Economia. I'm, I'm going to ask, oh, I'm going to make my comment in Spanish, since most of the people here speak better Spanish than English. Uh, <clears throat> Mira, you can I would like to know the reaction of the panel to the following. I believe that the current post-truth uh, reality is something invented also by the media. It's nothing new. In general, when the political environment in a society reaches high polarization levels, this is exactly what happens. I think we realized this because it happened in the US, which is the time that one has seen the highest degree of polarization and we have a president in the U.S. who attacks the media. In Latin America, we know that Correa does it every day. Cristina Fernandez attacked the media every day. And it was full of lies. At times of uh, popular unity in Chile, there were no social media, but there were rumors and people said water will come to an end, there will be no water tomorrow, and everybody started gathering water. So don't you think we are overvaluing and confusing the environment, that there is social media, that the media is changing. But in fact, this is not a new phenomenon. Thank you very much. And let's take the third comment. And the panel will take all these very interesting comments and answer. I am Ana Vajares, the minister, women's minister in Paraguay. I understand exactly what's being explained. And I go a little beyond this. And I would like to comment on this question of the rumors, the question of social media. This rumor means that we go with a few concepts or demonizations of some topics, and we lead society backwards. And why do I say this? Now we have a demonization of the gender ideal. And anything related to gender is looked at twisted. And we criticize even if we don't know what we are referring to. The question of social media, I won't talk about the press, but the last thing we read is what we consider the truth. I read Wikipedia, and we all read re Wikipedia, and we take it and believe in it as truth. And really, the contributions are very good. It's very helpful, but it is worrying because rumors who become viral on the media are taken as the truth and certain positions are adopted but nowadays we are going backwards in the advancement of women globally Felipe yes um, so about the role of the the academia um, uh, how to fight populism remember that populism must always use kind of three tricks in, in order to get what they want the first one is that they want to divide the society in terms of those who are the good guys and the bad guys the second step of populism is that, is that they, the populist guy said, I want to save you from the bad guys because I am a good guy. Once the populist is in power, he wants to change the, the rules of the game in order to remain in power forever. So if, if you ask me what to do in order to fight populism, actually, nowadays, it's easier to fight populism in the terms of being very direct. The problem is that think tanks many times uh, stay in their desk <coughs> writing papers and they never tell the real story. They don't go further in order to kind of translate a paper, an investigation, a research into a story. And we need human beings as stories, since we're kids. So um, that's kind of the missing link if you want to really fight populism. And, and when I go to universities, I, I'm invited many times with guys from the very extreme left to debate. Most of the time, I start the conversation with the, with the students saying, Please, um, always when a politician like me starts saying something, be skeptical. Um, a critical view of everything, try to think twice. We are very good about telling that we are the savers, uh, that we are Jesus that are going to save the world. So, so be careful about those guys. And when you start saying that, uh, everything else uh, goes very uh, nice. 
And, and, and so my invitation is to be very brave about being straightforward about what do you think in every single element. And what you were saying, um, Minister, um, about now that the social media is, everything is kind of taken as truth, it's not so true that, because I'm, I'm being attacked many times um, in, in many different situations, and then I have like in 30 minutes I can I put out my, my cell phone and I can say what I think about it, and I can post it on Twitter or Facebook, and everybody will know my view. The problem, and you are right, if you don't react quickly, if you, if you keep kind of saying, oh, this is not important, yeah, it would be it, viral. It, then, then you are really in a big, big problem. But if you really take seriously this massive conversation, I don't see uh, as, a, as a big problem. Bernice, what are your views about this, and especially about what the minister was saying about some like gender uh, issues being trolled on, on social media? So there are consequences there, right? Yeah, of course. Um, so I apologize because I didn't understand, I think, two of the comments in Spanish uh, or questions. Yeah, I couldn't get yeah. it. <laughs> um, so I'll just respond to your, yes. your question. Um, in terms of trolling online, it seems like there is a, a certain set of behavior that happens online that is maybe facilitated by anonymity that is different from when you have person-to-person -person, uh, interactions. So I wonder if there could actually be um, a greater link between uh, what happens online to how we relate to each other as people. And this is essentially, again, culture shift, right? Because the kind of trolling that you see online, the kind of things that people say about women, about LGBT minority groups, uh, is, is really quite appalling and also um, stuff that you may not see as much in person. Because when, you, when we interact an anthropologically as people, when we interact in an in, in-person in format, um, there, are, there are things that we, that we would not say as easily or as casually that may hurt another person's feelings uh, to the extent that it does online. So then what are those mechanics that we have when we are in person, the kind of trust, the kind of goodwill as the starting point instead of aggress aggression as a starting point. Okay, then we have one comment here and then Ricardo Hausman. Okay, thank you. Uh, Felipe, I, I would like to go Please back. Please present yourself oh, sorry. briefly. Mm -hmm. um, um, my name is Alex Scalia. I'm a journalist and I've been handling uh, corporate communications for a while. Um, you were talking about uh, web literacy uh, as one of the most important uh, tools to fight the, the post through. Uh, my point is on the algorithms, because uh, in, in a way, social media, Facebook, Twitter, tend to put together the same kind of messages you are uh, sending to the world. And so how to fight back that? Because if you're talking about uh, web literacy, uh, it, it, you, I would think on getting diverse op opinions and social media tend to put together all the same kind of stuff. And so we are talking about, we need to learn, people need to have access to different views, but all the tools put them just seeing the same thing. And this is why I see uh, the, you, you, you have trolls and you have all those, these organized movements uh, growing uh, to attack a certain party or person or whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Ricardo? Uh, I have a Ricardo Hausmann from Harvard University. Uh, I have a question for Felipe Cast. You said that people, what in the end they want is the government to deliver. Uh, and I, I want to question that. Um, do they want the government to deliver or do you want uh, uh, the government to represent or to create the nation that they think they are or they want to be? So. So, you know, uh, when Obama was elected, it was this great excitement of we finally are one big nation. There's not red America, blue America. There's not black America. There's not white America. There's the United States of America. And in, in some sense, Trump says, no, no. Listen, guys, uh, we, are, we know who we are. We know who we are. We are not Latinos, right? And we are not Muslims, right? So we know who we are. And, and so, so this is the country is for us, not for them. And, and 
so I'll put a wall, I'll put a ban, etc. Because that's who we are as a nation. So I don't need to deliver on complicated public <laughs> services. I'm, I'm delivering on this sense of who we are. And another one, and then we answer. Microphone there, please. Raise your hand. Thanks. Hello, uh, I'm Carolina, I'm a global shaper from Belo Horizonte Hub, Brazil. Um, you said a bit about web literacy, yeah. and I wanted you to discuss like, uh, what's our role on getting the whole point of view, the, the whole, uh, all the points of a subject or something, because uh, we protect ourselves when we unfollow people that have opposite a point of view, and also algorithms are like tailoring content directly to us. So how can we empower ourselves so we guarantee that we have like the whole, the whole view of the no. subject or band? Thank you, Carolina. So Felipe Cast, do you want to answer the question of yeah. Ricardo and others? So Ricardo, you're absolutely right that, that actually politics is not only about kind of running a, a business, right? So it's not only about the, the, the final line or deliver. It's obviously about um, telling a story as well. And, and, and as you were saying, Obama was telling a story. Now Trump is telling another story. At that moment, actually, a very sad story, what Hitler did in, in Germany. Um, and if you remember, even though we didn't have social media, Hitler was very effective of using the media at that moment in his favor, the radio. Um, so you are very right. We can, we can absolutely um, cheat on that game, in this game. The good thing about democracy, and that's one of the bad things about what happened in some countries where you don't have democracy, real democracy. Um, for example, what's going on in Venezuela uh, or what's going on in Cuba um, and in many other places is that eventually we do trust that society will realize whether that story was just a, a fake story. And in order for that story to, 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 to kind of to break down, we need to fight in the, in, in the arena of stories. We need to really tell our truth. Um, and, 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 and we are kind of our hands are tied because we know that we cannot, we don't want to use force. We want to persuade. And facts are important because eventually, even if you tell the nicest story in the world, facts will actually affect people and that will actually make the story less or more credible depending on the facts. But ideas and uh, straightforward ideas are very important as well. So when, when Trump is saying something that is good to build a wall, you really need to argue against that idea with arguments and with your story. And uh, the problem is that establishment at, that, at some point, and that happened in Chile as well with the Concertación, who was a very nice, well-organized uh, coalition and for 20 years was governing in Chile, is that eventually that, that coalition st stopped telling the story of the dream they had for the country. And if you, trans if you transform politics in, in something that doesn't have a dream, that you don't have really a kind of a goal on why you are in power. And I think some sort of that happened in, in, with, with Hillary Clinton in the last, he offered kind of security, he offered establishment, but no dream at all. And if you don't have a good reason to be in politics, in, in our case in Chile, our main dream is that we want every children to have the opportunity to reach their dreams. It's a very simple goal, and then you have a lot of policies in order to reach to that dream. But if you're here just to keep everything as a status quo, then you won't get that far. Thank you. Felipe and then Bernice. Uh, sure, thank you. There's been a number of comments since I last spoke, so I'm going to try to address most of them very briefly and happy to then continue the conversation afterwards. On the role of academia, the, the question that came in the, in the back, I think, I think academia has a huge role to play, I think. <laughs> Uh, for starters, academia has to lead the way on how we get better and smarter and quicker about listening to one another. I think there's the application of a lot of uh, very new and innovative survey methodologies, uh, like a random domain intercept technologies, for example, that would better allow us to do far more active listening that would then inform policy recommendations. I, I think that there could definitely be use in that. I think academia can also lead the way on practical experimentation and on evaluation of approaches to democratic governance 
to fact-checking and to the um, way in which innovative approaches to storytelling will lead or not to changes in perception and behavior. Um, and so I think that, that those are some of the, of the ones. On, on the question about Latin America uh, and whether we're overestimating, um, many of us in the room who are from Latin America, who've lived in Latin America, who are familiar with Latin American politics, I'm sure are struck by the amount that we've spoken about Trump. <laughs> because yes. there's a meeting about Latin America and uh, having uh, populist leaders that hate on media and, vol and, and fight against vulnerable rights is something that we've seen throughout our entire lives in most of our countries. Um, and, so, and so while the phenomenon in the United States is quite interesting, what we're seeing in Latin America is, is uh, not new. I think so perhaps we're overestimating the newness of it because of how apparent it becomes in social media. But to the minister's point, I don't think we're overestimating the impact that it has. Um, I, I'm glad that you brought up what is happening with, uh, uh, with women's rights because on the vulnerable populations, the creation of these cones in social media make it easier to attack and to defame those who are uh, fighting to protect vulnerable rights. The commitment that I mentioned earlier from a media network also goes to organizations uh, working to protect vulnerable rights, like the Anti-Defamation League, who's going to start doing some experimentation on how to protect vulnerable rights in the digital space. Um, and so definitely more, more to speak about that. And then one last point on algorithms, um, because I, I'm really glad that you gave me an opportunity to talk about algorithms. Um, there's a responsibility for social media companies like Facebook um, or for search engines like Google to understand the impact that they're having on the public debate and the public discourse and the fact that the algorithms that they have and the way that those algorithms micro-target users providing content that those users are likely to already agree with is detrimental to the debate that is required as part of democracy. I think those organizations are taking steps um, to, to move towards a direction that is hopefully more conducive to building trust and consensus. But nonetheless, that conversation doesn't end there because it's far, like Bernice was saying, it's a cultural issue that be goes beyond technology. And so I think to your point, we, ne we, need, we have an individual responsibility to go beyond the bubbles in which we are. I think, I think those of us who are in this room and those of us who have the opportunity to be leaders in our sector um, have not, not just the necessity, but also the responsibility to be the ones who are checking on the context of sources, who are going about sharing within our networks information that is, that is truthful, that are calling out information when it is not truthful, that are thinking about how we bring stories that will bridge cultural divides, um, that if we're talking about immigrants or refugees or post-conflict in my country, Colombia, that we were able to do so in a way in which we use human-centered stories so that people better understand the implications of policies. So I think, yes, companies have uh, uh, responsibility to look very closely at algorithms. There's algorithmic accountability is an increasing issue, but those of us sitting in this room and beyond have an individual responsibility to also ensure that those algorithms don't, don't put us into cones from which we can't come uh, out of. Thank you, Felipe. Bernice. Um, okay, just picking up on a couple more, couple of comments. So first, um, Felipe was talking about algorithms and how that relates to breaking your echo chamber. So it's really great that you raised this question and the fact that you already have the awareness to say how can we get the fuller picture is the kind of thinking that we want to encourage more. Right? And the role of academia can actually play a role in shaping our young students in like embracing this kind of discerning critical thinking mindset. Right? Um, the the al algorithmic accountability is actually a topic that um, I think is going to be one of the very important ones shaping the strength of our information culture and, 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 the, and democracy in that regard. Yeah. So then what does this mean for corporate regulations perhaps in the future? If we, if we imagine a Black Mirror episode, I don't know how many people <laughs> yes. here watch the TV show Black Mirror. Terrifying. Right. So then the, what kind of... Um, possible future laws can we imagine 
that keeps companies that have such power, because technolo technolo technology companies are going to be uh, the most powerful sector, uh, at least one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful sector in the next 10 years. I'm not even going to say 20 years, 10 years. So, so that's um, a couple of the uh, points I wanted to touch on. And finally, the gentleman in the front who talked about um, electing or supporting a president, not just as a person to deliver on policy X, but that this is the person that I identify as someone who will shape the country I want. Right? So a lot of people have said that in the US, it was not really a contest of, um, it was not an issue of economic anxiety. This is a perspective that I'm sharing but that it was an issue of demographic anxiety. The society, the composition of uh, American society was changing at a pace that was more fast than, than, than comfortable for the people who were facing it. And so if you are white and middle class and you find that the privileges you used to enjoy are becoming less, so this is a slightly sensitive topic, right? We're talking about how times have changed from segregation in America, and I'm using the American example because it's the most pronounced one, where privilege disparity was the greatest. And then now we're talking about making it more equal. But to the person who ex is experiencing this, it is, it is a drop in their privilege. So of course, they would feel certain emotions. And when they see someone who is saying that, I will look after you, but not only will I look after you, I will, I will take the privileges that was given to the other people that were not deserving and give it back to you, right? So this is the kind of, um, this is the kind of fuel that feeds the demographic anxiety that we're seeing where they could not find another answer, where they could not find another candidate that would respond to this anxiety in a more, uh, in a less populist way. Yeah, thank you. Well, this is time to finish. So we are leaving the room with uh, great concepts by our panelists. For example, the responsibility that Felipe was saying about, you know, of all leaders, opinion leaders, politician, businessman, academia, of fighting lies and hate speech directly and embrace people fighting that to fund uh, media outlets that are fact-checking massively and uh, to quick react as politicians to fake news not to to you know put your to be there for people and to to be open to say what is not true and to uh, promote debate and discussion and uh, and going from thinking one to two in the sense of you know trying people to really reflect uh, uh, and not take the first impression that is normally emotional and related to anger that can have as an outcome populism so thank you very much to the panelists and thank you all for coming thanks thank you